thanks everyone for being here. Uh, welcome to the next edition of our series, Let's Talk News Business, a digital event series at the Craig Newmark Graduate School of Journalism, where we discuss the future of the business side of news, product, revenue streams, questions around leadership, management, and in this case, entrepreneurship. So then this one and the next two editions of the series are dedicated to questions around entrepreneurship. Um, part of the reason being that we are starting a brand new uh, digital program uh, for aspiring uh, media entrepreneurs. And we'll share a link uh, for that in the chat later if someone wants to uh, look that up uh, or sign up for the mailing list. So we thought um, it would be a good idea um, to dedicate a few of these conversations to entrepreneurship. Um, my name is Anita Sivina. I run uh, executive ed uh, here at the Newmark J School, and I'm very excited uh, for the two guests uh, I have here today. Um, Cheryl Dorsey is, uh, well, she wears many different hats. She's the CEO and founder of uh, The Plug, um, a media outlet that's focused on covering uh, the black innovation economy. Um, and she's also doing a lot of other projects that are focused on, um, uh, on covering the black innovation economy, covering entrepreneurship um, and, uh, and fostering change uh, in that space. Welcome Cheryl, good to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. And then uh, I'm also very excited to have my colleague and friend Jennifer Choi uh, here uh, on that call with us. I learned so much from Jenny uh, here at the school every day. She's uh, she also wears uh, several hats. Uh, she runs a News Integrity Initiative, a project that she's going to tell us something about uh, a little later in that call. Uh, and she's also responsible, uh, together with a team here at the school, to drive diversity, equity, and inclusion um, initiatives here at the school. Thank you for being here with us, Jen. Thanks, Anita. <laughs> Fantastic. So um, let me kick it off maybe with a with a bit of an ecosystem question, uh, just assuming that I see that several of the attendees um, that are joining us today in the chat are maybe not from the US and might not be as familiar with the stage of uh, DEI in the media ownership and media entrepreneurship stage uh, um, uh, phase. Jenny, can you tell us a little bit about um, your experience and maybe share some insights and facts on uh, diversity, equity, inclusion when it comes to media ownership and media entrepreneurship in the U.S.? Sure. So um, the News Integrity Initiative at the Newmark School is a granting intermediary. We make grants to um, mainly newsrooms to adopt um, approaches and methodologies to build trust with communities. And um, when we were looking at the root causes of the trust gap, um, we identified that um, in order to reach communities that are historically disenfranchised and marginalized, um, we needed newsrooms to also represent the communities that they are serving. Um, but also we were seeing that a lot of the journalists of color that were um, operating in these newsrooms were experiencing trauma, as you're seeing now with the reckoning. Um, but also a lot of these journalists of color just wanted to leave and start their own news organizations. Um, so we saw an opportunity um, in January to make a round of grants um, to promising emerging leaders, including Sherelle, um, to really develop a new kind of um, opportunity and to really double down on um, these entrepreneurs who are really kind of defining um, the next generation of um, journalism organizations. Um, broadly speaking, part of this work has also included um, collaborating with other funders um, to create um, a fund called the Racial Equity and Journalism Fund that's housed at a, uh, an organization called Borealis. And that was mostly in response to the fact that we saw in philanthropic funding of $1.1 billion between 2013 and 2017, um, only about 8% of that um, total number went to people of color led organizations and projects, news organizations and projects. Um, so this fund was created to really um, explicitly and intentionally invest in people of color led projects. And part of that work was also identifying the media um, entrepreneurs of color ecosystem 
and we learned that about 22% of all media, on, uh, people of color led news organizations, only 22% were nonprofits, 27% family owned and the rest are um, LLC, C Corp and others. Um, so it's really interesting to look at how many media entrepreneurs of color um, are actually um, finding creative sources of capital because um, many media entrepreneurs of color are historically shut out of these um, opportunities in terms of accessing cap capital for their businesses, um, whether they're starting up or to sustain their businesses after the um, initial startup phase. Um, and I've learned a lot. Um, I should also um, do a shout out to Jonathan Jackson, um, one of the co-founders of Blavity, who really taught me about the ecosystem and how to pivot from a traditional foundation investment model, which I come from uh, working at the Robert R. McCormick Foundation in Chicago, to more of an angel investor model with a, a much more nimble fund. So, um, so that I can talk a little bit more about the details um, later in the call. Thank you so much. Uh, Cheryl, can you talk a little bit about your uh, your experience and uh, your perspective. Yeah, so, um, so again, my name is Cheryl Dorsey. I'm the founder of The Plug. We do uh, data-driven smart reporting over on the Black innovation economy. So that's everything from startups to um, sort of founders and leaders in this space, as well as sort of what's happening in the trends shaping the workforce of Black technologists and inclusion um, across tech companies around the world. And so, you know, I started, I started off just as a daily tech newsletter that I kind of created while I was still working. Um, my background is in tech. I worked for Uber as a marketing manager, uh, went on to Google Fiber. I'm a Seattle girl raised on the Microsoft campus. So it was sort of something that um, was always of concern to me that the individuals I was trained by, raised by, supported and mentored were not the individuals that were seeing as being quoted in kind of the daily tech and business news cycle, um, nor were there companies and innovations. It was always like the Mark Zuckerbergs of the world, the Elon Musks, what have you. Um, and as like a black girl from Seattle who was trained by black women software engineers, I felt that there was this disconnect in terms of what does genius and innovation actually look like. Um, and so I, I wanted to see a difference. I wanted to foster a different kind of conversation that was meaty and rigorous um, and less, less like pandering, which is kind of what we've traditionally, I think, seen in media, um, especially if all we're talking about is diversity, inclusion, and racism. Like in the last couple of weeks, considering the current climate, those are the conversations and stories that tech reporters want to have with myself as well as some of my colleagues. Um, so we'll see kind of following this if there's actually going to be coverage outside of just those mm. conversations because um, all of the individuals that I've been interviewed also have very esteemed degrees and backgrounds. And so I'm hoping that the conversation will extend beyond just race and trauma. Um, mm -hmm. And so that essentially is the essence of the plug. Uh, smart reporting that covers Black tech news um, in a very substantive way. And I started again as a daily tech newsletter, didn't put um, a ton of resources into it, but kind of bootstrapped towards uh, building original content, launching subscription uh, component of the site for premium subscribers. And then also working kind of on the sales space to attract um, larger brands to help fund this initiative. And it has been, definitely been a journey this far. As Jenny mentioned, we received um, some resources in the form of a grant, um, you know, from um, the New York News Integrity Initiative and um, some resources from like Knight Foundation, the Facebook Journalism Project, you know, fully sort of going this route of tapping into the, the journalism community and grant opportunities that exist to help fund. Um, you know, obviously I could probably have gone the venture capital route, but I think it would not have been in support of the values that I have around the integrity of what journalism is supposed to be versus just kind of growing fast, breaking things and returning a value to my investors. So, um, you know, as a black media publisher, um, I think it's important that we stay tech minded for sure. Um, but also kind of just have a distinguished um, kind of case study around our work um, that, that helps us to produce sustainable, smart, um, long form, uh, you know, material that is also helping to shape what the ecosystem looks like today and in the future. 
Excellent. Thanks so much for sharing that. Um, let's stay a little bit with that ecosystem question, because I feel that sometimes, you know, um, that is sometimes uh, lacking in the discussions, uh, the awareness that we are, we need to shift uh, perceptions and we need to uh, shift policy and we need to shift uh, um, education. Uh, so basically, there are a lot of different angles um, that we are working on. Jenny, can you, from your experience, talk a little bit about what you feel, what are the biggest kind of turning points that we need to focus on if we want to drive transformation here? So um, there are two things, and I've, I've learned so much um, from Sheryl in these conversations that we've had. I mean, you know, um, we haven't had just kind of a, um, I'm so much of um, the way that we're trying to grow the ecosystem and change the narrative around the opportunities of doubling down on these entrepreneurs that, like Cheryl was saying earlier, um, can the return on investment is just so much more significant um, from an ecosystem uh, perspective. There were two things. So in the nonprofit world or um, foundation grants, overall, there are lots of studies. And this is what I was seeing, um, I mean, honestly, 10 years ago when I started um, working in grant making for journalism, was that a lot of um, folks who were in for-profit news organizations started to pivot to nonprofit because their business models were failing. And so um, a lot of folks that started pivoting to the nonprofit model felt like they were opening themselves up to um, uh, receiving grants um, by you know, filing that 501c3. And quite frankly, a lot of folks that they knew from other jobs in newsrooms started working for a lot of these foundations. Mm -hmm. So because of that history and the relationships, this is what we don't often talk about in philanthropy, um, the access was easier for a lot of folks um, who wanted to pivot to nonprofit and filed as such. And we also saw a lot of folks from for-profit industries that did not want to struggle in their newsrooms anymore. If they um, uh, established their brand as, you know, with a strong byline or they had a really strong column and they wanted to start their own organization, you know, it was easier for them to identify fans who were philanthropists to do the one or $2 million investment for them to start up um, pretty um, sizably. Um, but, you know, in terms of media entrepreneurs of color, we were seeing a couple of things that a lot of media entrepreneurs of color were for profit. They came from, you know, a very, like Sherelle was saying, bootstrap, you know, small business mentality, which we know in the bigger uh, picture um, contributes to a stronger economy. Actually, a lot of nonprofits isn't necessarily what builds um, our economic health as small businesses do. Um, and so a lot of media entrepreneurs of color who are for profit just didn't have access or quite frankly wasn't invited to this, you know, um, process of what foundation or what applying for grants could look like. So what's interesting um, with uh, that really drew me to Sherelle's story and what she was doing at the plug was, um, you know, really making this case that the black innovation economy, for example. I mean, that black businesses were thriving and actually were rated higher, thriving meaning the delivery of their services and goods was rated very high. Um, for example, Dr. Andre Perry and his studies around economic inclusion with Brookings, that there, was, there were a lot of these folks with small businesses who were doing really great, but the access to capital just wasn't there because of these systemic, um, you know, racist um, historic practices where we deny access to that capital. And I definitely see, saw that in the media entrepreneurship landscape as well. Um, oftentimes when we're looking at economic and small business um, development opportunities, at least, you know, where I've come from in Chicago, uh, local journalism was often left out of that, um, larger conversations. So while I was seeing, um, you know, place making local investment opportunities to build wealth around communities that we were targeting, for example, JP Morgan Chase, um, and um, the city of Chicago and those public sector developments, I had to identify these um, media entrepreneurs that had trust and credibility from their audiences to connect some of those small business opportunities and economic development 
opportunities for a healthier overall um, economic um, ecosystem. Great, thanks Jenny. Um, Sherelle, can you talk a little bit about your own like path to entrepreneurship and how you made the decisions between for-profit, non-for-profit, how, how you approached that, you know, the funding part and your experience with that ecosystem? Yeah, I'll, I'll just say, I think that, you know, I think that where, and, and again, my bias comes out of kind of always being in tech companies and sort of seeing from the inside out um, how resources are allocated and the opportunity to build wealth. And I always found that Nonprofit is great if you have substantial funding behind you or you have some family money, but I, I mean in entrepreneurship in general, it's always great if you are starting off with a significant amount of money or at least networks and contacts to get there. Um, and I felt that far too often, particularly as like a publisher, a black publisher, um, and someone that hails from like a very multicultural community, a lot of times like black and brown people are, are told to start nonprofits. You know, that's kind of like what we're allowed to do. And I, I didn't see that being in the best interest of what my goals are, which are to grow a profitable company, eventually sell it. Um, so having the opportunity to build and grow wealth for myself, as well as my community, um, my employees, uh, you know, that I eventually hire, being able to have like stock options and signing bonuses and the things that really mark what tech has provided and sort of how uh, folks of color that are able to get into tech, that opportunity that has created a new sense of wealth for folks that usually does not provide access within communities that like I come from. Um, I wanted to figure out how can I replicate that exact same model. And so I fully went into this number one kind of haphazardly um, you know, so much <laughs> primarily because of my experience, but then also I don't come from a wealthy family. I come from a middle-class black family who, you know, went to college, did what they were supposed to do, purchased homes, but that doesn't necessarily mean the designation and passing down of generational wealth. And so for my family, it's like, I wanted to build something that would provide that access and opportunity. And so I knew that the only way to do that was going to be through creating a venture that could either A, be investable to get us to growth, um, or, you know, or B, like create an opportunity to have an exit and then go on to continue to become an investor myself, to build another company, what have you. So that was very clear to me, the pathway in which I saw, you know, my white male counterparts taking in order to create substantive resources for themselves and for their families. And I want that same thing. So for me, nonprofit was never, was never really on my radar because I felt like a lot of people ran nonprofits. I felt like there was a ton of inefficiencies. I, you know, again, coming out of the tech world, coming out of startups, there's just a different mentality in the way in which you run business and the way that you think about revenue. Um, and even for the plug, even though I started kind of with this bootstrap model, within six months, we got our first five-figure check. And so it was, you know, the grants have been very additive thus far as like another revenue stream for us. And that helps for us in terms of working capital. Um, but I am constantly focused on how do I increase subscriptions? How do I increase a sales process for our advertising? That's top of mind in addition to the journalism in and of itself. Um, so, you know, so again, for me, it, it is just as personal as it is about the mission. But we like I can't I can't ignore the fact that the income inequality gap between communities of color, particularly black and Latinx communities is substantially different um, when we look at wealthy white communities. And so it didn't seem like it was in my best interest to create something that would put me behind again, unless I got like a $10 million grant, <laughs> you know, that would help us set up for success. And I just knew that that wasn't going to be the case. Um, so that really was kind of what framed my thinking around this infrastructure and setup. Um, and the entrepreneurship really stemmed from, I've always been very entrepreneurial in college. I had a couple of different businesses in high school, you know, when I was learning web design and coding and things like that, I was, I was um, helping some of my mom's friends who had businesses and um, organizations that they ran. I was helping to develop those, you know, so I was always finding external ways in which to 
use my talents and skills to bring in money. You know, I paid for my own college. So I always had to figure out like, how do I cover my rent? How do I do these things? And how do I use my brain um, outside of, you know, working at Starbucks, which I did, <laughs> or working at The Gap, which I did, um, but also finding and creating value in the world through my talents and skills. So it was, you know, it was what, you know, the tech industry prizes around hustle. I've always known how to hustle. Um, and so deciding to fully go entrepreneurial was really about seeing this need and this gap in an industry that kind of didn't seem like anyone, particularly within newsrooms, was really hyper-focused on. And so I saw an opportunity to create uh, what I saw missing. Um, and then secondarily, I desperately enjoy the freedom that I have as an entrepreneur. It's extremely frustrating, as you know, um, leading a team, making decisions, sort of always having to be on. But when I think about some of my experiences working in corporate America, especially as a black woman, it's, it is far different. I'd rather have these stresses versus the ones that I had mm -hmm. in those spaces. And so it's also for me a respite. If I'm being completely candid, you know, it's a respite. I don't have to deal with the politics of a corporate environment, of being gaslit or my work being devalued. And some people have great experiences that, you know, and, and I definitely learned a lot. But for me, I was like, well, if I'm going to be stressed out, I may as well build my own thing. Um, so very multi-layer, very multifaceted, but for the most part, um, you know, I'm, I'm here to, to build wealth for my family and for my community. You know, actually on that, and Cheryl, thank you so much, um, just to kind of underscore um, what you've been talking about. So 45% on average um, media, um, so media organizations run by people of color, 45% typically comes from ad revenue and 2% typically comes from grants. So, I mean, just to kind of outline, there's still an opportunity. We need to democratize, um, obviously, access. And clearly, we're still very imbalanced in terms of investing in people of color-owned um, organizations. But Terrell, we've talked about, and it's, it's interesting um, because when we were talking about, um, you know, pitching to investors, and you know, you cover in black tech and black innovation economy, all these folks that are, um, are continuing to thrive in their businesses, but specifically in getting or winning capital for media is a little different and has its challenges. And um, I would love for you to describe, it, it's funny because I was having, um, and this will forward promote one of your um, next Let's Talk um, news business, uh, I was talking to Nick Chen of Pico and I was like, he was like, you know, I just won this and this and this from this VC. And I was kind of like, what about media? Like, can we do this for media? And he said, you're going to have to productize, you know, whatever you're trying to do in media because there's no money in media and you can't sell that. And so Sherelle, um, you've, you've also kind of taught me about that landscape and opportunity. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more to the unique challenges of um, identifying capital for media. Yeah, I think, um, I think, again, you know, for those of us in very highly tech driven spaces, um, there's always kind of this like next shiny thing. How do we like make Roblox tell us the news and like all the fun, fancy things that are great to experiment with, but I think also a challenge around like practicality, right? Like I think that we have to think inclusively around like my mom, you know, the only thing she can do is click open my newsletter right like she's not gonna ask she just joined facebook after refusing for like the last 10 years so i'm not gonna create a bot on facebook for my mom to get my my news right. update that's just gonna be highly impractical um and so you know what media has traditionally in terms of venture capital it has been very robust it's been unsustainable in terms of the way that media works and it's fueled this identity around false metrics when all we're looking at is page views and growth beyond like measure, some people have been able to do it well. But like when I was at, you know, when I was in J school, it was like, you know, Gotham disappeared. Um, DNA info had shut down. And you saw like folks like Mike who were, eva who were valued at like a hundred million dollars, like end up having to sell for like less than 10 after having raised all this venture capital. So watching this, this process and really looking at the unsustainable way in which we had turned our stories into clickbait news or things that weren't really reported, it was very disenchanting to me. 
um, it was also disenchanting to kind of see the struggle of the full-time work of having to raise money and convince people of what you're trying to do and accomplish. Um, and then I think also for me personally, I just don't like being told what to do. So <laughs> there was no way in which I was going to build a company and then have someone tell me how to run it or like, you know, determine what my key priorities and metrics are. Um, and, and again, I have advisors that kind of help to advise and counsel. But in terms of investors who are putting significant dollars and resources into you and then expecting a return on investment, which means that I can't ever sleep, I can't ever rest because I have to pay back that debt, right? Mm -hmm. and, so, um, and so we also look at the fact that the, the funding for media has atrophied a great deal, right? Like that it's just not there in a substantial kind of way. And so particularly when we talk about like traditional venture capital, um, you know, there's not really a way I can go get a loan from a traditional bank. I could take out something from like a PayPal or an American Express and pay an absurd amount of interest rates, but it, that doesn't really make sense in terms of kind of the slow progression towards revenue that my company will experience, um, you know, as we continue to grow and add on more talent. So you kind of have to think through um, you know, what do you have access to and how do you kind of leverage that to the best of your ability? And, you know, my capital has to come in the form of like social connectivity, right? It has to come in the fact of like, I have to show up to the journalism environments and I have to be very clear on what my mission is. I have to be clear on what it is that I'm selling because it is still a sales process, right? It still is like, I have to be very defined about who my audience is, how we're serving them and being able to sell that to the foundation world because regardless of whether or not the business model makes sense right now to kind of the nonprofit foundation journalism space, I think being able to articulate the business value, but then also being able to demonstrate, and journalism traditionally is about public service. So being able to demonstrate how this serves the community is going to be substantive in those spaces. And in VC, they just care about the dollars and the metrics. So it's been an interesting play in terms of living between both worlds, but being very clear that like media is not the most sustainable business, especially when we think about the hiring of talent. You know, I think we've, we've seen just in the last few months, unfortunately, the closing of more, um, more newsrooms, more layoffs. It's such a precarious industry. And so for me, it's like taking this hybridic approach of, listen, I have distributed teams, we're remote, we don't need a fancy office or a ping pong table or catered lunch. Like we, we don't, you know, I'll send a Postmates gift card when we do team meetings sometimes, <laughs> like that's probably as fancy as we're going to get. Um, but when I think about being as lean as possible and really operating from a space of value creation, I'm able to control for costs. And even if I'm not able to hire a hundred people, if I hire five, but I vend with other folks in their businesses, I'm still helping to fuel an economy, but I'm just being very smart. Um, and I, and I, always, I always kind of you know, push folks, especially from an entrepreneurial lens to books like Lean Startup by Eric Ries. You know, it's like, we don't, we have to rethink our business models in general. And it's worked out for us. Honestly, you know, I was very concerned that COVID would completely obliterate any of our subscription revenue. And in fact, it's increased over 300%. Our partnerships have increased. And, you know, again, like we're getting smarter every day and the new tools that are being developed are also helping us to extend some of those pipelines and opportunities around managing the business as a whole. Um, and I'll quickly just say this, um, and I know a lot of folks wanna to get to questions as well, but, you know, for me, especially being a technophile, it is far simpler for me to think about automation within my business to help increase efficiencies so I can direct dollars to the most critical tasks that need to be completed to grow the business. So being able to use, you know, everything from Asana to Notion to develop a, a knowledge base for my team to using obviously, you know, video tools in order to connect, um, being able to measure obviously all the analytics tools, but even the day-to-day -day operations of the business. I don't have to hire an HR team when I use Gusto to process payroll. Right. And like, and I have to do that. I have to be nimble. You know, there's so many different opportunities. I, I use bench for accounting and this is not a commercial by any means. <laughs> it, it just really is like, I, I think about my tech stack in terms of, wow, if I had to pay a bookkeeper every month, 
that cost would be prohibitive. I'd already be in the black, I'd already be in the, in the red. Right. Mm -hmm. But I can pay bench like 135 a month right. to organize all this for me so that when I give it to my accountant for tax time, it's all developed and it's organized. And then my brain as a CEO feels like I'm on top of the streamlining of the operations of my business because I have these automated tools and, um, and, and contracted opportunities to outsource a lot of these things and stay, stay lean. Last year, I went to Costa Rica for a month and I worked, I worked from the mountains in Periscal. And, and so it's like, I wanted that kind of freedom in the way that I've built. Um, and then just secondarily, I also love the philosophy of Paul Jarvis on Company of One. If I'm never able to hire an employee, how do I run a substantive, well done business that, you know, returns revenue um, and profit and still I can, I can kind of be responsible for myself and those who I interface and interact with. So I, I try to think in those very simple minimalist business terms, um, we'll, we'll see what happens. <laughs> So far, so good. Um, but for me, again, knowing the restrictions and limitations around funding, it helps me to adjust. Yeah. And it's not even in a like in a negative way. It's just I'd rather not stress myself out having to pay back six million dollars in funding mm -hmm. versus incrementally. I have earned every single subscriber. Right. I've earned every single opportunity. We've put in the work, we've built the relationship. And I think quite honestly, our community is so much more rich as a result of it. Yeah. I think, and I think Sherelle, that is what, what impressed me personally so much when I, when I, when we talked for the very first time, this laser sharp focus on, on, on business. Um, and I'm saying that because I do feel that, and you mentioned that in, in the conversation before, um, and you as well, Jenny, th there is a tendency that, uh, you know, that the shift towards nonprofits that obviously is not per se a, a good or bad shift um, leads some, some uh, founders uh, to believe that being a nonprofit or thinking about uh, becoming a nonprofit means that you don't have to run a business and you don't have to understand how to run a business. And I think it's, it's important to say, I mean, that's also a belief that we have strongly here at the, at the school uh, that we do in our executive education programs. We focus, we, we think everyone needs to understand, you know, subscriptions and need to understand growth and needs to understand marketing, even if you decide at some point that your business model is going to be uh, not for profit. Um, you need to understand the metrics of business, right? Um, especially if you're a woman or a person of color, you needed to have the credibility uh, in the room and to be able to answer the questions. And obviously that, that might be unfair, but it's still the way it is. So I felt many of the things you said are spot on. Um, we received quite a lot of questions and I received um, some before our conversation. So I'll try to get through some of them here. Um, one that has come up in the, in the Q and A now and that I've uh, received beforehand is uh, around COVID-19 and the impact of the current crisis. And I think that's a fascinating question. Is that, is the current crisis and COVID-19 actually helping increase diversity, equity, inclusion in media ownership and media entrepreneurship? Is it deteriorating um, uh, the status that we're seeing? Does it have any impact at all? Jenny, do you have any, any thoughts on that? Well, to be completely candid, I mean, oftentimes when we've talked about journals of color thriving in their existing newsrooms, everyone thought maybe we needed to wait for the powers that be to retire or die. And I feel like um, the stresses of the pandemic have kind of forced the conversation uh, around making room um, for new leaders and new models. Um, and I think it's really accelerated that conversation in the industry. Um, people are tired, people are fed up, and um, the civic and public discourse around this has really um, intensified in ways that I hadn't seen um, in the last five to 10 years. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for that. And then there is an, an added COVID question that's probably more um, geared towards Sherelle. Um, how has COVID impacted your revenue streams, uh, ads and subscribers? And you mentioned that briefly that it had a, uh, that you saw a, a big surge in subscribers. 
Yeah, I mean, it's been pretty interesting. I think um, we've we were we've gotten the attention um, of of folks. I think there's a lot of people who have kind of recognized their own biases in in terms of um, you know what they read, what they watch, you know how they kind of show up as it relates to folks kind of outside of their traditional demographics. And so we've definitely seen an increase in not just subscribers um, in paid subscribers, but also in terms of companies that want to work with us and um, particularly uh, help to support and fund uh, sponsorships and advertising. We launched a data fellows program for the summer to assist with some additional work that um, we needed to take, and take care of over the next couple of months. And, you know, we put out a call to um, to have people sponsor, you know, the fellowship program. And within about a week, we raised the resources we needed to ensure that we could provide paid, you know, fellowships, um, you know, for, for these particular fellows. So there's definitely a sense of urgency. And there's a sense of, I think, um, you know, folks really redirecting and rethinking about how they show up for businesses of color and particularly publishers of color. And so, obviously we've benefited from that. It's been somewhat bittersweet, right? Because like within the last month, I've probably had more requests for speaking and for presenting in the last 30 days than I have maybe in the last two to three years. And my message hasn't changed. My work hasn't changed. All of those things like kind of all being equal. The reality is it also shows and demonstrates to you just how undervalued we've been for far too long. And, and yeah. Well, on that, um, I think what we're seeing is that young people who want to become journalists or um, matriculate in a journalism program, they don't want to work for legacy media institutions anymore because they're seeing how toxic they are or even huge digital media organizations. They'd rather work for the plug. That's what we're seeing um, as far as how the conversations are changing. The people would rather work for the plug than for the other organizations that you're hearing about. And I'm going to say that this is something that we're also seeing as a school, as a journalism school altogether, which is part of the reasoning why the, the, the new entrepreneurial program that we are starting is focused on these, you know, solopreneurs, uh, niche entrepreneurs, people who want to, you know, make a living covering a community, but don't have this vision of scale, uh, Silicon Valley style scale, where they feel it has to become a business that they sell at some point. I mean, there is place for a lot of things in the ecosystem, but but we are also convinced that that is that that is an important part. Let's let's stick with that uh, with the topic of to dos for players in the ecosystem for a moment, because I I want these conversations to be actionable in the sense that people listening to it who might be funders who might run programs in J schools who are in roles where they can impact uh, and change the ecosystem. Let's talk a little bit about our uh, briefly about our wish list for funders and our wish list for education institutions, our wish list for policies. Are there some specific things that come, come to mind that you have, both of you have on your mind? Yeah, if I can jump in, um, sure. I definitely think supporting entrepreneurship based endeavors is critical to what the J School experience looks like. I think that with so many folks who question the value of J School, which I will always be a proponent of, the opportunity to learn how to be a great journalist, um, you know, through training, of course, I think in the era of disinformation, like we continue to need strong journalists um, who know how to report and cover stories. Obviously we need to factor in what does diversity and inclusion look like, um, you know, in that, in that aspect. But we also have to be training journalists to be formidable leaders um, as well as data experts and have that kind of hybridic approach to computation as well as um, just very keen and sharpened, uh, you know, skills. So, you know, I did a data concentration within my program. Um, and then I think also that entrepreneurial track is super critical. And, and it doesn't mean that every journalist that goes through a J school program needs to be an entrepreneur, but I think being able to have access to business strategy and thinking I think it's only going to make you better, regardless if you decide to join a startup, media publication, 
um, create your own like Substack right now has a fellowship program for writers. Um, I'd love to see a journalist get something like within that realm. And I think what also this kind of short term micro entrepreneurship could be pretty interesting as well, where maybe you're launching a publication that is set to serve a certain community for a period of time on a particular topic. I think that we don't all have to build publications that are gonna last for the next hundred years. I think we could do these shorter stints that provide visibility to a topic or a community. And I think that with the kind of technical tools that are available, when journalists are able to think about how to structure their media publication, where to go to get funding, how to, how to kind of tackle the right metrics, how to hire a team. You know, I think, that, I think that that kind of thinking and that kind of ingenuity can be taught in a J school environment along with the business acumen. Um, so that way, you know, when they're done with that project and maybe they're doing it in J school, maybe they're doing it for a summer, maybe when they're done with that project, they have such a tremendous piece of work or a body of work that they can demonstrate to then bring into whatever newsroom it is that they decide to land in. Um, and, and then that way there's much more optionality in terms of like career opportunity, um, you know, moving forward. And so I, I think that, you know, I think that, you know, again, especially just as a media publisher of color, you know, there's also opportunity for J schools to be the next funder of these businesses, to set aside resources, to provide opportunity for seeding some of these ventures and being the catalysts to the growth of new kinds of media publications in a way that we haven't seen before. Right, Jenny, any thoughts? I mean, I'm just very focused on capital, moving capital, um, how does capital get accessed and dispersed? And I think that, you know, if we're talking about 8% of total philanthropic dollars going to um, people of color led media organizations, if by 2045, um, people of color are going to be the new majority, um, I think the stats should match um, what we're talking about in terms of communities and communities served. My hope and dream is that a racial equity and journalism fund doesn't exist anymore because everybody else is auditing their existing portfolios and making sure that they're intentionally investing proportionately the communities that um, we want to reach um, as a journalism community. Thanks. Um, so let's talk, there is a question from David uh, Grant that I think is interesting because we, we, we talk obviously about starting new ventures, but uh, one thing that we also have to focus uh, our energy on is the, the black publishers, the black owned newspapers um, that are already out there and that are struggling to innovate. So how do we infuse entrepreneurial thinking and the kind of digital business savviness into these businesses? Any thoughts on that? I think there definitely um, is some training required. I think obviously, um, you know, CUNY J School has this great entrepreneurship program that's coming up um, in the spring. And so there's some opportunities to kind of tap in there. There's obviously a ton of online courses and opportunities that um, provide kind of snippets into ways to innovate and to kind of follow. I try to share as much as possible also about how I'm building the plug. Again, by no means am I an expert because I'm building the plane as I go. Um, but I do try to be as vocal about what my experience has been thus far. Um, I think primarily as well, kind of know, know when to take a pause to find an A player that can come in and help like create a new model. Um, and to find out really what what isn't working, you know, I think that that transition is is not going to be easy. I've not run, um, you know, a smaller newspaper in a community that has traditionally been underserved, so I don't want to purport that I am an expert in that. Um, but I, I think that you know, there's kind of a, a a meeting of the minds of finding you know that person that can come in, whether it be as a consultant or maybe a new lead or director to kind of help to shift the priorities and the kind of coverage um, to help remodel the entire business model and infrastructure. Um, if you traditionally have been, you know, supported by your local community advertisers and small businesses, and we know that almost what 41% of black owned businesses will no longer exist um, after this year due to the pandemic, then we know that that's a substantial amount of revenue you're going to lose. So what are the options for 
for new advertising and you know how do you do that on a local or community level and part of that too might be going to some of the local funders and community foundations within your community and making the case for listen you know help us sustain for the next two years and you know here's our business model we'll be able to to create a sustainable path for ourselves we just need the runway to stay alive so that our community is still being served um, maybe there's a rev share agreement, you know, with some of your current advertisers where maybe they're not paying you upfront cash, but maybe you're, you're, you're providing kind of a, a pay per, pay per view, pay per click, pay per, you know, redemption sort of model. There's so many different ways in which you can kind of restructure, be sensitive to the current climate. Um, but then also like making the case and being, you know, there's kind of that, that hustle mentality, but more important, like get it done. If you're on your last leg, you know, get it done. Start setting up calls and conversations, you know, connecting with some of the corporations within your community um, or, or within your region or your city and saying, listen, we'd love for you to be an under, underwriting, you know, uh, advertising supporter and we'll have you all over our, our new website that we're remaking. Um, and don't, you know, don't um, turn down potential volunteers who also want to assist. There have been a lot of people that reach out to me all the time and they're like, hey, we've got this really cool thing we're doing. We'd love to support the plug on X, Y, and Z. Um, definitely, you know, say yes at your discretion. Um, but, you know, if there's ways in which folks can help you elevate and it's either low or no cost um, and you can kind of, you know, in through in-kind service, you know, amplify them as a form of payment, I would say definitely take advantage of that as well. Excellent. Well, these were some fantastic last, last words. Sadly, we are already out of time. I, I want to thank you both for being so generous in, in sharing your experience and, and your wisdom with us here. I think that was a fantastic discussion. Thanks for, for being here. And thanks to everyone who joined us um, as a participant uh, today and listened in. We're going to have another um, Let's Talk News Business coming up uh, next week, again, Wednesday, uh, 11 a.m. ET. And that's again going to be focused on entrepreneurship and especially on the, uh, on the trend that we see emerging of people kind of going solo and covering their communities, covering their niches. We're going to have Jennifer Aitley and Rose Eveleth and my colleague Jeremy Kaplan is going to moderate this discussion next week. So we really hope you'll join us for this one as well. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye.